Lieutenant Barton reporting, sir. Oh, yes, Barton. Glad to see you. I understand you're here to fly away a Curtis P-40. That's right, Mr. Collins. Is this the one? That's it. It's all yours. And it's a fine airplane. I've just been giving it a workout. I suppose you're anxious to go over the instruments and controls and really get acquainted with the P-40, huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Aren't we going to use this one? My Curtis P-40? No, we'll use that plane over there on the jack. Well, I never got anywhere on a pair of jacks. Well, we open on jacks, Barton. <laughs> the aces turn up later in the final showdown. <laughs> you see, Lieutenant, with the plane on jacks, you can operate the landing gear and get used to the controls before taking the ship off the ground. I might as well hook up my parachute and safety belt, I guess, so I'll feel at home. That's right. It'll help you get familiar with the cockpit. We recommend the use of these shoulder straps. They'll keep you from being thrown against the instrument panel in case of a mishap. We've found that the best way to learn the P-40 is to study one system at a time. So let's start in with the fuel system. Here's the fuel selector valve down here at your left. Yes, sir. I see it's labeled with the capacity for each tank. Yeah, and when you set it in position, you'll feel a positive click. Well, Mr. Collins, is there any certain order for drawing fuel from the different tanks? Yes, there is. For taxi and takeoff, we recommend the fuselage tank because it's higher, and the fuel flows with more of a gravity head. Also, as the fuel is used up, the airplane's center of gravity moves forward. This causes the plane to become more stable and makes it a better gun platform. This gauge on the instrument panel shows the amount of fuel in the fuselage tank. Of course, if you're flying a plane with the belly tank attached, you should start using that tank as soon as you've climbed a bit. Then, if you get in a fight, you won't waste any fuel. When you pull this release and drop the belly tank from the plane. When the fuselage tank and the belly tank are empty, switch to the rear wing tank. The gauge is on the left side of the cockpit floor. I see. Then you save the front wing tank until last. That's right. Uh-huh. Is there any sort of a signal when your fuel runs low? Yes. Normal fuel pressure is between 15 and 16 pounds. And when any tank begins to run dry, well, of course, your fuel pressure drops. And a warning light flashes on in time for you to turn to another tank. On the lower left side of the instrument panel is the switch for the electric fuel pump. It's a good idea to keep the fuel pump on all during flight, so you won't forget to turn it on when you need it at high altitude. The cooling system of the P-40 is regulated by the cowl flap. And these flaps should be open whenever you taxi, take off, or climb. In most P-40s, the flaps are controlled by a manually operated lever on the right side of the cockpit. But in some of the P-40Fs, the cowl flaps are controlled by an electric switch. You put the switch up for automatic operation. If the automatic feature fails, can I still operate the flaps? Yes. You can put the toggle switch down and hold it to the left to open the flaps or down and to the right to close them. Well, Mr. Collins, of course I know the cowl flaps regulate the temperature of the oil and coolant, but what temperature should I try to maintain? Normal oil temperature is between 40 and 90 degrees centigrade. Coolant temperature is between 85 and 125 degrees centigrade. Now, if the coolant reaches 125, a light warns you to open the cowl flap and cool the engine down. 
Of course, you never take off with the coolant temperature above 125 degrees. The landing gear and wing flaps of the P-40 are raised and lowered by means of hydraulic pressure. This is the flap control right here. To lower the flaps, you push the control handle forward and pull the lower trigger on the control stick. Don't get mixed up and pull the gun trigger by mistake. The flap should never be lowered when your airspeed is above 140 miles an hour. At higher speeds, you might damage them by trying to put them down. The plane also becomes too nose-heavy. Are the flaps automatically locked in position? Not until you move the control back to neutral, like this. I see. And I suppose the flaps up position is back here. Yes, Martin, that's right. To raise the flap, you move the control back and pull the trigger on the stick. The flaps go up pretty fast, so don't try to raise them at slow air speeds when your altitude is below 500 feet. At air speeds less than 110 miles an hour, the plane will mush down if you raise the flaps. So if you overshoot the field, gun the engine and climb back up to 500 feet before you put the flaps up. The landing gear control lever is here on your left. To raise the gear, push this pin forward and lift the handle. But don't do it while the plane's resting on its wheels. <laughs> that would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Yeah, but one of my fellows did it the other day. Was he hurt? No. He got away before I could catch him. <laughs> but you're all right as long as the plane's on deck. So uh, go ahead and raise the gear. How soon after the takeoff did the gear be retracted? Just as soon as you clear the field. Watch the indicator, and when it shows that the gear is up, check the position by operating the hand pump. be stuck. I can hardly move it. When the pump is solid, the landing gear is locked in retracted position. Now put the control back in neutral. And that locks the hydraulic fluid in the retracting system. Before you lower the gear, be sure to reduce your airspeed below 175 miles per hour. The hydraulic mechanism is not designed to force the gear down against the higher airspeed. Then push the control handle down. That's it. Now pull the trigger on the stick. That starts the gear down. Before the gear gets all the way down, retard the throttle. All the way back? Yep. So the warning horn will blow until the gear is down and locked. Then when the horn stops, the gear is safely down, as shown on the indicator. That's right, Barton. It's always a good idea to check the hand pump. Then lock the system by putting the lever back to neutral. All P-40s up to the L model have an emergency hydraulic system. Now, to operate the emergency system, unlock the catch at the bottom of the hydraulic hand pump handle. Put the handle on the emergency pump. And open these two red emergency valves. Don't open them now because the main system's on. But if the main system is shot away, you can get the wheels down by operating the emergency pump. You'll have to land without the tail wheel or the flap because the emergency system operates only the main wheels. The brakes are on a separate system, so they'll be okay. Now, maybe I'd better explain the throttle quadrant. Tighten this knob just enough to keep the controls from creeping. Are the P-40 controls different from any others? Yes, the operation's a little different. Take the mixture control, for instance. Now, you'll notice that there are several settings. Full rich is for emergency use if the automatic mixture control should fail. You probably never have to use it. 
Auto Rich is for all high power operations take off, climb, and combat. Manual is for long distance economical cruising. Auto Lean is an automatic setting for economical operation at lower power, below 2300 RPM, and 30 inches of manifold pressure. And idle cutoff, of course, is for use when stopping and starting the engine. The mixture control is clear enough, but what are these two controls? Well, they operate the automatic boost control and the two-speed supercharger on the packet-built Rolls-Royce engine. The boost control automatically provides takeoff power with the throttle full open and the boost control handle up in this position. And at retarded throttle position, the boost keeps the manifold pressure constant. When do you turn the boost control off? The only reason for turning the boost control off, like this, would be if the automatic feature should fail. With the boost control off, don't open the throttle too wide or you'll get too much manifold pressure. Yes, I know better than to take too much manifold pressure with a low RPM. That would make the engine knock. That's right, Barton. And engines have been known to blow up when allowed to detonate or knock for only a few seconds. You should always raise the RPM first. Then bring up the manifold pressure. And to cut the power down, reverse the procedure. Okay. I think I understand the operation of the boost control, but what about the two-speed supercharger? When do you switch to the high position? Move it to high when you reach an altitude of 13,000 feet. But first, you retard the throttle slightly. Otherwise, the high supercharger might build up too much manifold pressure. Now, move the supercharger control up fast. That's right. And then open the throttle again to get the desired climbing manifold pressure. All P-40s are equipped with Curtis electric propellers, and you should know how they work. These two switches on the instrument panel operate the propeller. The left switch is a circuit breaker and should always be on. The right switch controls the pitch of the blade. Now, when it's in automatic, you can use the propeller governor lever to select any RPM you want. With the switch in manual, the blades are fully locked, like a fixed pitch propeller. Can you change the pitch of the blades? Sure you can. To increase the RPM, hold the switch down and to the right. To decrease the RPM, hold the switch down and to the left. What pitch do you use for takeoff? Always take off in the automatic position with the governor control lever full forward for 3,000 RPM or emergency military power. The governor will hold the RPM constant at 3,000. Open the throttle to full takeoff power to the stop with an Allison engine and past the stop in the case of the Rolls-Royce engine when the automatic boost control is on. Then, after takeoff, you reduce the power. About this much? Yeah. Retard the throttle to approximately 35 inches of manifold pressure and pull the propeller governor control back to the desired RPM position. Was the switch still in automatic? Yes, you leave it in automatic for normal flight, but for long cruising, put it on manual and lean out the mixture just as you would with a fixed pitch propeller. Green marks on the tachometer and manifold pressure gauge show the maximum power condition which can be held for continuous operation. Have the mixture at auto-rich for the normal power condition. 
For long-range cruising, reduce the power below 2,280 RPM and 30 inches of manifold pressure. Auto lean mixture setting may be used at this low power. Well, how about it now, Barton? Are you all set on the propeller? Yes, I think so. What's next? Suppose we go through the operations of starting the engine. Now you make the settings as I call them off. Right. Mixture at idle cutoff. Throttle, one inch open. Fuel on fuselage tank. Carburetor air, full cold. This prevents possible backfiring into the engine compartment during starting. Battery switch on. Generator switch on. Fuel pump on. Three right-hand circuit breakers on. Gun switches off. Now check your fuel pressure. Fifteen and a half pounds. Okay, then prime the engine. How much do I give it? One stroke for a warm engine, three if the engine's cold. Then shut off the fuel pump. Shut it off? Yeah, to keep from flooding the engine when you move the mixture control forward. All right. Now, the next thing would be to turn the ignition to both and engage the starter. But we won't do that while the plane's on jack. After the engine fires, advance the mixture control to auto rich and the throttle to 1,200 RPM. Then turn the fuel pump back on. If there's no oil pressure within 15 to 30 seconds, stop the engine and investigate the trouble. If the oil pressure is okay, 60 to 80 pounds, warm up the engine at 12 to 1400 RPM until the oil temperature hits 40. And the pressstone temperature at least 85 degrees centigrade. During cold weather, leave the cowl flaps closed until the engine is warmed up. With the propeller switch on manual, run the engine up to 2,300 RPM and check the magnetos. A drop of more than 100 RPM on a single magneto indicates faulty ignition. If the magnetos are okay, then switch the propeller back to automatic. Release the parking brake and taxi to the runway. The tail wheel is steerable by the rudder pedals, so don't ride the brakes when you tax it. Now, when you get to the runway, and just before you take off, make a final check of everything. Fuel selector valve on the fuselage tank. Fuselage gauge showing plenty of fuel. Fuel pressure, 15 to 16 pounds. Oil temperature above 40 degrees. Oil pressure, 60 to 80 pounds. Coolant temperature above 85. Right-hand circuit breakers on. Gun switches off. Battery on. Generator on. Propeller on automatic. Propeller circuit breaker on. Mixture on auto rich. Propeller governor in full forward position. Automatic boost on. Supercharger in low speed. Elevated trim tabs at TO. Takeoff position. Rudder trim tab at one and a half marks to the right. Aileron trim tab neutral. Cow flap open, and you're all set to go. Over there on the runway is Lloyd Childs. Chief test pilot for Curtis Wright. He's going to put that ship through some maneuvers for us. 
And as he does, I'll try to give you some pointers on handling the P-40 in the air. Okay? I'm all set. All right. As the plane starts down the runway, open the throttle with a positive, steady motion. That's it. And still with the brakes at first. Then use the rudder to steer when you get the tail in the air. Engine torque pulls the left wing down. So keep the wings level by holding the stick to the right. Fly the plane off the ground by lowering the tail just a little at the takeoff. Then you don't take off in a three-point attitude? No, because that might put the airplane in a stalled condition, which would be bad at your slow speed right after takeoff. You see, engine failure or a gust of wind when you're stalled so close to the ground could be disastrous. But just as soon as you clear the field, retract the landing gear and retard the throttle and propeller controls to normal flying power. Pick up speed as soon as possible and climb at 140 miles an hour. Now, to gain altitude fast, you can climb at full military power for 15 minutes with the Rolls Royce and five minutes with the Allison. These settings are marked with yellow lines on the instrument. The P-40 is normal in all flight characteristics, as you'll see when Lloyd goes through his maneuvers. But I've heard that some new pilots tend to over-control because they're not used to the long nose of the liquid-cooled engine ahead of them. Slight changes in the heading of the airplane with respect to the horizon appear to be more than they would with radial engine airplanes. However, after a few minutes of flying, I'm sure you'll be able to do it smoothly and easily without fighting the controls. B-40 is 82 with the flaps down and 92 with the flaps up. Just before the stall, there's a slight tail buffet to warn the pilot. And the stall, if allowed to continue, throws the plane in a spin that loses a thousand feet of turn. Now the P-40 will come out of the spin by itself if the pilot lets go the controls. But to come out in a hurry... Cut the throttle, kick the rudder in the opposite direction to the spin, and shove the control stick forward. Well, I'm glad to know the plane will straighten out by itself. But if I get in a spin, brother, I want to do something about it. Now, let's see now. To come out in a hurry... I cut the throttle, kick the rudder hard in the direction opposite to the spin, and shove the control stick forward. Okay, Lieutenant. That'll take you out of the spins in a hurry. But when you start flying a pursuit airplane, the main thing you've got to learn is the right way to land it. As Lloyd comes in, I'll point out a few things for you to remember when landing a Curtis P-40. And the first thing to do 
is to cut your airspeed to less than 175 miles an hour while you're up around 3,500 feet. Get your landing gear down while you still have plenty of altitude. Last-minute operations and maneuvers are apt to upset your good landing technique. Circle the field at approximately 140 miles an hour. To get accustomed to the slower airspeed and to familiarize yourself with the field and get set for the landing. What items do you check off before landing? They're all listed on this checkoff card. The first thing to do, though, is open the cabin. In fact, most every old-timer will tell you he can judge airspeed better when he feels the breeze in his face. And it's safer to have the cabin open if you hit a ditch and end up on your back. If you ever happen to end up with the airplane on its back and the cabin closed, you can open the kick-out panel in the left-hand side of the sliding hood by means of this red lever near the lingerie. There's another emergency exit you can use during flight. Up here in the top of the cabin roof is a red lever. Simply pull this lever and it'll release the whole cabin. Then you check to make sure the mixture control is on auto rich and the propeller governor control at 2650 automatic settings. It's a good idea to have the propeller set this way for plenty of RPM in case you have to give her the gun and go around again. On the other hand, you should not set it for full 3,000 RPM because it might momentarily over-rev if you open the throttle too fast. Of course, the fuel selector should be on a tank with plenty of gas. The carburetor heat control full forward and the gun switches off. And test the hand pump again just to make sure the landing gear is down before you put the landing gear in neutral. While you're still high up, put your flaps about halfway down, make a wide sweep, and glide toward the runway at 115 miles an hour. Trim the elevator tab so the plane will glide hands off at this speed. Line up with the runway while you're still a mile away. This will prevent last-minute maneuvers, which sometimes cause ground loops. New pilots have a tendency to undershoot the field. They cut the throttle and come in short. So remember to keep the throttle slightly open when you first come in for a landing. At 500 feet above the ground, put your flaps full down, cut the throttle to one-half inch open, and glide in at 115 miles an hour until you're over the runway. When you're 10 feet off the ground, cut the throttle and level out for the landing. When all the wheels are down in the three-point attitude, apply the brakes fairly hard but not hard enough to lock the wheels or raise the tail. Remember, most landing accidents happen after the plane is on the runway. So concentrate on rolling straight until the plane comes to a stop. I can understand that, all right. Well, then, Lieutenant, I guess you've got it. Is that really all there is to flying a Curtis T-40? It doesn't seem at all complicated now. Well, there's nothing complicated or difficult about flying this airplane. Once you understand the things we've carefully gone over. Now, just remember to take it easy. In fact, they tell me a warhawk, like that one over there, is apt to take off by itself if it's left alone too long. I get you, sir. <laughs> I'm practically in the air right now.
Well, on that landing, you look like a veteran. Oh, thank you, sir. Getting fond of this airplane already. Okay, Lieutenant. And you're all set. So long, fella. Lots of luck. Thanks. Hadn't I better wait for those two P-40s to come in? No, that's just a couple of the boys waiting to give you a send-off. Go on up and join them. 